Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blog. Today I'd like to discuss diet and gut control. As you can see right there. As you can imagine, I get uncountable numbers of questions about this diet and that diet, and it never stops. What about this expert, the vegan, the vegetarian, the raw guy, the banana eating guy, the juice drinking guy? And the list just goes on and on. The guy that eats cockroaches and has muscles and can lift heavy weights. And, you know, I've seen everything and heard everything. So, as I often do in my blogs, I try to explain key points that are often misunderstood, particularly in the layperson reading a lot of this stuff by various experts, which often leads to confusion due to a lack of just basic understanding of human physiology. So today I'd like to share a little awareness about how the gut actually works based on the science of endocrinology, how the nervous system works, and just basic anatomy, really. So let's take a look at a couple of things that, if understood, may significantly influence your desire to keep following diet books and diet experts. Not that there's not some value in that. But as I'll point out, the ultimate value is you learning how to better manage yourself, not follow what's written on a piece of paper because it made somebody else look or feel good. So first of all, we want to talk about how the abdominal brain works. ENS stands for enteric nervous system. The entron is an older medical name for the gut tube. So everything from mouth to anus is called the entron. So the enteric nervous system is what controls the functions of food moving from gut to anus, the digestion process, breaking the food down, etc. So that's largely under control of the enteric nervous system, which is predominantly the solar plexus, which is sometimes referred to as the abdominal brain. The real expert on the concept of the abdominal brain and the person that did the most research and writing was Byron Robinson, MD, who wrote a book called The Abdominal Brain in 1899. His second edition came out in 1907. I have them both and they're absolutely excellent. If his second edition was published today, it would probably still be breaking news. There has been another book published more recently called The Abdominal Brain, which is a more recent scientific investigation, which really just supports everything that Byron Robinson told us back in 1907. One of the things that you learn when you study the abdominal brain is something quite profound that very few people are aware of. Research shows that there's more neurons in the enteric nervous system or the solar plexus the abdominal brain than there is in the spinal cord and brain combined. There are more neurons controlling digestion and elimination through the abdominal brain or the solar plexus than there is in your brain and spinal cord combined. This is why it is often referred to as the abdominal brain. Most of us are so used to thinking of anatomy the way that's presented in most schools i.e. the musculoskeletal system is over here and it functions this way, the nervous system is over here, it functions that way, the hormonal system is over here. But rarely do ever people help know how those things work together because medicine is broken up to, into different branches. So endocrinology is a branch, orthopedics is a branch, etc., etc. So it's so territorialized, it's as though if you cross over the line and step into someone else's territory that you're sinning or something, Therefore, the whole model is based on the model of reduction of science, but really the human organism is a holistic organism that is fully integrated. So let's look at a brief summary of what the research on the enteric nervous system or the abdominal brain shows with regard to regulation of the body and its overall influences. And let's take a moment to consider how that may influence this whole concept of dieting, particularly the diet that's right for you or the diet that's right for everybody. In other words, should everyone eat a given diet, an Atkins diet or uh, a South Beach diet or whatever the fad of the day is, and believe me, there's a lot of fads of the day. 
What we find out when we look at the control mechanisms of the enteric nervous system, and this is based on solid research, you can look at the resources I mentioned, the enteric nervous system or the solar plexus is in a bi-directional communication relationship with the parasympathetic nervous system, that's the digest, eliminate, growth and repair system, with the sympathetic nervous system, which is its functional antagonist, that's the flight, fight nervous system, that's the branch of the nervous system that moves blood out of the organs into the muscles to prepare you for work. So this nervous system and this nervous system are functional antagonists. If the parasympathetic system is my left hand, the sympathetic is the right hand, the more wound or stressed you get, or the more physically active you get, the more sympathetic activity you get, and the more relative suppression of or decrease in the activity of the parasympathetic system. There's never an on-off. You always have to have parasympathetic support, and you always have to have sympathetic support. But as stress rises up and stress hormones rise up, you get more and more sympathetic activity. And if that's kept up too long, it suppresses parasympathetic activity or what I call an anabolic rebound. To the degree there's stress, we must have adequate growth, repair, and recovery or the body begins to break down. The endocrine or hormonal system, endocrine means hormonal, is in a constant communication and relationship with the solar plexus or the abdominal brain, particularly because hormones are, shall we say, molecules of communication and molecules of experience. Those things are essential for directing all the functions of the body. It's almost uh, as though it's a chemical language that the body speaks to talk, just like music can be a language and math can be a language. Hormones basically take the vibration of thought and produce emotions and inner experiences in order to convey the inner experience of the thought so that it's not just intellectual, it's an inner experience. So the hormonal system's responding to your thoughts, your emotions, and all the messages from all the other systems to give you a grand total reaction, but it is in constant communication with your gut. Next, the limbic emotional system the limbic system is the part of you that processes emotion. And remember, pain is scientifically considered to be an emotion. It's also processed by the limbic system. For example, research by Linus Pauling showed that when a person's in pain, on average, they consume about 20 times more vitamin C per hour than when they're not in pain. So there is a huge limbic load that produces a significant load on the need for resources. Yet if a person's diet does not change, based on before they were in pain to when they're in pain, they may not realize that while they're in pain seeing therapists and taking drugs to manage pain, they're having huge increases in the demand on their resources, but they're not aware of that, so they often don't do anything to supplement their diet in such a way to get high quality foods as opposed to just taking pills. So all thoughts and emotions have a direct effect on the control of the gut the gut tube and all gut processes, and the somatic or peripheral system, the musculoskeletal or non-visceral tissues, are also constantly communicating with the abdominal brain to regulate things like your cravings. For example, if you go out in the gym and do a heavy weightlifting session, you're probably going to have an increase in the body's desire to absorb amino acids or proteins and possibly fats and carbohydrates, etc., but particularly proteins because of the tissue damage from exercising. Therefore, this influences, this exercise influences the actual function of the gut. The dotted line represents the lumen of the small intestine or the lumen, the tube of the gut from mouth to anus. So that could be the stomach, that could be the small intestine, that could be the colon. They're all under control by the abdominal brain. So one, as I was sharing, remember the, the collection of neurons controlling digestion elimination or gut function is actually bigger in its total size and, and uh, neuronal capacity than your brain and spinal cord. That's critical. Two, the gut tube is technically external to your body. When you eat something, it is not technically inside your body from a medical perspective until it is absorbed through the gut wall. Then it's in your body. 
So the enteric nervous system really, if you, if you want a clear way of thinking about this, is monitoring everything that's coming into you from outside your body. When you eat food or drink water, that comes in from outside your body. So when things come into the gut too, it's as though all the neurons and all the microvilli, you have massive amounts of microvilli that are feeling, sensing, and selecting what they're going to absorb. There's something like 40,000 microvilli per square millimeter lying in the small intestine. The surface area of the small intestine, it's stretched out, is the size of a tennis court in the average human being. So there's a massive surface area of micro fingers and little hair-like projections, each which are looking for and sensing the presence of and wanting to absorb their key nutrients. So remember that this system is very heavily populated not only with nerve endings, but it's also heavily populated with immunoglobulins, particularly immunoglobulin A, because it's your first defense on the inside against things coming in from the outside. So if a person's under stress, chronically, we see a lowering of the secretory IgA or immunoglobulin A, and whenever the adrenals are under stress, all the mucous membranes begin to break down, which is how leaky gut gets triggered. And anytime you're under stress and your body cannot respond favorably for reasons of lack of diet, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, lack of any of the nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, movement factors or imbalance in there, then the gut begins to leak and undigested food particles pass through and trigger immune reactions and all kinds of stuff that I talk about in my courses, resources, etc. So what we see here is that dietary influences such as what you're eating, if you eat sugar, for example, if you eat processed sugar to the point that it stimulates your body, remember processed sugar is highly acidic, so number one, it triggers a sympathetic activation right off the bat. Two, it'll speed your breathing up because if you eat enough sugar, it begins to try to acidify your blood, which causes the body to have to breathe faster to try to alkalinize your blood to keep you alive and to keep you stable. So you can see right off the bat that just one input can change the balance of the autonomic nervous system and change your breathing, which then regulates endocrine function, which has an effect on your limbic emotional system, which determines whether or not you can effectively recover from the stress of your day, your workout, etc. Now, without going through a long, detailed explanation, you can actually influence how your body absorbs and what it absorbs based on inputs from any one of these factors. Therefore, in order to actually have a diet that works, you have to be willing to pay attention to what your body needs and what your body is telling you. If you're following a plan or you're eating too limited of a diet, and you don't follow a plan like my four-day rotation diet in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you can easily lack the variety in your diet to mount a healthy, favorable response to any of these given stressors and any of the needs of each of these systems because each of these systems has nutrients that it needs to feed it and to develop its resources, whether they be hormonal, tissue, um, mineral, trace mineral, enzymatic, etc. So... Learning how to pay attention to what your body needs and developing a relationship with your body and remembering that food is man's first medicine, as Hippocrates said, not pills and bottles. You can go a long way to saving yourself a lot of money and gaining a lot of vitality and improving mental function, emotional function, physical function, sexual function, creative ability, stress handling capacity, exercise response, and your capacity to uh, access your intuition or spiritual development because a healthy body is a healthy, gives you the basis for a healthy mind, which gives you the basis for inner calm, which gives you the basis for access beyond your thoughts. So what are some tips? Consider your stress, uh, stress factors, not just your body response. In other words, if you look in the mirror and you see a body that's getting fatter, it's the wrong approach to say, well, I'm getting fat, I need to go exercise more, or I better cut calories back, or I better go on some kind of a diet. The question should be, if I'm getting fatter, and that's not my natural state, what's disrupting the balance between the autonomic uh, systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic? 
what kind of endocrine influences may I be having? Am I working in an environment that's toxic, such as a hair, nail, hair salon or a nail salon or an automotive garage or a body repair situation where there's chemicals in the air? Or am I a fireman breathing all sorts of toxins? What sort of emotional state am I in? What's going on in my life right now? How well am I doing with school or living my dreams or my relationships? What's happening with my body with regard to exercise and any sort of pain or dysfunction that I may, may be having that could be winding up the system, stressing the sympathetic system, endocrine system, and limbic system that may require different nutrients to balance. So in other words, it's not, if you're just looking at your body, you're seeing what's happened because of an imbalance here. So to think, all I gotta do is starve myself or exercise the hell out of myself and not look at what's actually caused the problem creates a big problem. This is one of the problems with all sorts of medical tests. You go to the doctor, you don't feel good, they take a test. What they're doing is taking a snapshot or a photograph, shall we say, of you at the moment. But if you see a snapshot of me at the moment right now, it doesn't tell you anything about what happened leading up to this moment. So if someone has high stress hormones, for example, you can make that as a general assumption, but if they don't tell you that they just got in a fight with their wife on the way for testing or that they did a heavy workout yesterday, the test can be very, very misleading. So you cannot rely too heavily on medical tests without looking into control factors such as nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. And then you have to have enough awareness of behavioral influences and psychological influences because those things can all change hormonal levels extremely easily. So you need to individualize your diet based on needs. What are your body mind needs? How much flesh do I need to eat? How much carbohydrate do I need to eat? How much water do I need to eat? Should I be supplementing? What should I be supplementing with? What quality should I supplement with? Um, what types of other practices would be supplementary and maybe even more important? For example, if you're taking supplements for adrenal stress, but you're not doing anything to manage your schedule or do any working in such as Tai Chi Chi Gong, tai Chi Chi Gong breathing, meditation, or an inner practice, well, you can be taking supplements for the rest of your life because you're still treating symptoms of mismanagement of self. So some resources where I go into these things more deeply and give a lot more information than I can give in blogs is my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which I've referenced many times. We have a webinar called Eating the Check Way, some kind of under, uh, primal pattern eating, where I go through techniques such as muscle testing, connecting to your soul, and different ways, body uh, logging, diet logging, for different ways to learn how to monitor all these things and how to adjust them so you can individualize your diet. And for those of you with challenges, my one, two, three, four for overcoming addiction, obesity, and disease program is I believe nine hours, nine to 11 hours of audio, I can't remember, and about a 130 something page workbook that takes you through the steps as a general theme that I use for assessing people and trying to identify which of these factors may be playing into their overall condition and how can they take a four doctor approach to balancing healing and it looks at it also from a chakra perspective, so a body-mind perspective. So I hope it helps you to have some of these thoughts in your head so that you can better consider the whole concept of diet and realize there really is no escape. Many, many people have been on this diet and that diet and the other diet. The question I always have for them is what did you learn? If you were on the Atkins diet and you got off of it, what did you learn about eating that much flesh food that made you switch to another diet like the Ornish diet, which is much more vegetable based. And if you stayed on that diet for six months and got off of it, what did you learn on there that made you get off the diet? What was missing with the vegetable dominant diet that wasn't available to in the, in the Atkins or protein dominant diet and vice versa? Because one's teaching you what happens when you live without enough plant food and the other one's teaching you what happens when you live without enough animal food. So as you start paying attention to what your body's telling you, then you don't need to go six months. You don't need to go three months. You don't even need to go three meals. You feel what your body needs. I show you ways to check that in my Eating the Check Way program. You adjust and you could actually find yourself on any given day eating a variety of diets from almost a vegetarian to that of an Eskimo 
based on what your body needs at any given time. And that's really the sort of methodology behind the whole Czech Institute approach is that there's something in every diet that worked for somebody at some point in their lives. But what do you need to know to monitor yourself and create a diet that works for you? Just because someone's healthy, good looking, and intelligent, and sings a good song about such and such a diet, whether it be eating bananas or chewing uh, beeswax or whatever the hell they come up with, does not mean that that's going to work for you because what's going on in their life and what their individual needs are can be radically different from you. So let's take the opportunity, each of us, to take responsibility for the amazing gift of our body-mind and know that this is not only a temple, but it's a garden. And like every garden, it needs you, the gardener, to interact with it. And by loving the flowers and loving the plants and the trees, we pay attention to them and we learn to know when they're thirsty. We learn to know when we need more fertilizer or more calcium or more magnesium, etc. So I hope that's helpful to you. I'll look forward to sharing with you again soon. Thanks for joining me today.